Fellowship at World Fish Center in Penang, Malaysia. He will present, Can Agri-Value Chain Interventions Target the Poorest of the Poor? The Case of Matching Grant Programs. Let us all welcome and give warm welcome to Dr. Briones. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be here on the 10th uh, Mindanao uh, Policy Forum. Uh, when was the last time I was in this forum? I think uh, fifth? Fifth. Yeah, so yeah, five, ten. Very aus auspicious times to, to, to be here, and I'm glad to be back. Uh, President Orbeta regrets not being able to attend because today is simultaneously the Philippine Institute for Development Studies anniversary, 47th anniversary celebration. So uh, he will be joining us uh, via Zoom uh, towards the end. So um, this is part of the uh, celebration of the uh, or the uh, commemoration of the Development Policy Research Month for which the theme is expanding the uh, uh, growing the middle class. And this is also how I selected the topic, even though it is about agricultural value chains, I tried to relate it to our theme. And it is also related to a past, immediate past study we did uh, in 2020, finished in 2023. So you can see the reference there in the uh, PowerPoint, which I hope everybody uh, will be able to share later on. Matching grants as a strategy for enterprise development. So the question we pose is, so we interject. Uh, very often we think of agricultural value chains. I think we've heard of this topic before, no? Uh, and then we need to develop not just agriculture, primary agriculture, farming, crop production, hybrid rice. This is all very important. But we have to somehow also grow the rest of the value chain, the processing, the milling, the marketing to the uh, end consumer, and perhaps even for export markets, especially for, let's say, heirloom rice. Now, there's also often an association that this will also help the poor. In fact, it, it might be a chance for the poorest of the poor who dwell in the countryside. But maybe it's time for, to pose a question for research. And I have a tentative answer to this question uh, towards the end of this presentation. Next. Ah, uh, I think I have a clicker. Okay. All right, oops. What's going on? Okay. So we will look first at the value chain approach, the main issues. Uh, I will discuss also the case of matching grant project. And that matching grant project happens to be implemented in the rapid growth. I don't know if you've heard of this Department of Trade and Industry project. It is primarily implemented in Mindanao. So it's quite suitable for our uh, study today, uh, plus uh, the, the region uh, Eastern Visayas. So it's Mindanao plus Eastern Visayas. So we'll take a look at what this matching grant is. It might be a new word to most of you. So we'll look at the theory, the nature, the scope, the uh, evidence behind it. And then again, uh, look at RAPID as a form of this matching grant program. Then uh, we'll be looking at the results of a PIDS baseline study for this, and then we conclude. And I'm going backward. What's going on? All right. So what are the basic issues when we try to link value chains and uh, development and equity? So as I mentioned, value chains talks about increasing incomes by enhancing the vertically linked activities in agriculture. So I, again, beyond the traditional farming, there's the downstream processing, marketing and distribution, and then the upstream supply of inputs. So all of that is seen as an integrated system. So we uh, normally, traditionally, we have that red farmed output, but actually we want to develop the entire thing. And normally this also incorporates a strong element of enterprise development. So farming as a business, that red part, and then all of those are also organized as businesses. Input supply, nurseries, uh, processing, and very often we want MSMEs, especially including rural farmers, uh, <clears throat> rural-based households, even the farmers. So the farmers go beyond simply selling their raw cacao. They also produce 
some value-adding components such as tablea. Similarly, the coffee, rather than the coffee bean, they al already do some of their roasting and so on. Including all the way down, uh, uh, we've observed um, projects like uh, Coco Sugar. Of the, so the coconut farmer, rather than selling raw copra and be done with it, they process the raw sugar in the, uh, through their cooperatives, and the cooperative is are able, even able to sell to a marketing agent that could even be exporting their coconut sugar. Now, how is this linked with equity? We have for the, uh, as I mentioned, no, securing uh, the 22nd DPRM is securing a future for all by growing a resilient middle class. So I'd like to pose the question now whether this agricultural value chain approach, oh, I, I can't really shine the light, but that one on top, no? Does it, is it able to cater to the poorest of the poor? Or is it more targeted towards those who are near poor or what we call borderline poor, as well as low income households just beyond the poverty line? And this is directly uh, relevant because Poorest of the poor, you can ultimately, hopefully, you want them to socially move, achieve social mobility, and become growing middle class. But really, this is a uh, closer, um, more realistic achievement for the borderline poor and the low income to be able to graduate to a middle class and be able to therefore grow the ranks of such a resilient middle class. Now, let's clarify some terms. I stole this. So I should have also, I, I ran out of space to, to post the cover uh, page of, this is also from a discussion paper authored by um, my, um, by senior author of uh, 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 Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, myself, and uh, JP, uh, also a fellow of uh, PIDS. And here are some of the numbers being crunched. So uh, we have, of course, poor, we know that, based on the poverty line. So the low income is divided into poor and low income, but not poor. So uh, the poverty line nationwide is 12,030 pesos per month for a family of uh, five members. So in terms of uh, in 2021, so actually there are 2023 figures, but because this breakdown is only available for 2021. So 18.3% of the entire country. Unfortunately, there was no breakdown for Mindanao. So I'll just show you figures for the entire country. By the way, this has already gone down. I believe for 2023, if I've memorized it, it's now down to 15.6% of uh, the population below the poverty line. Meanwhile, the low income is the poverty line and double the poverty line. So all the households in between that range. And what happens? That's 41% in 2021. That's a huge chunk of the population. They're near poor, or um, yeah, they're just, just beyond the poverty line. Uh, well, I don't know if it's fair to say because that's already double the poverty line, but you know, that's not an impressively high income, right? 24,060 per month for a family of five, but still, uh, th that band covers 41% of the population. Now, middle income is between two and four times, uh, sorry, between two and 12 times uh, the poverty line. That's a big uh, chunk, no? It's a big wide range. So that's from 24,060. So it's divided into bands, no? But you can already just jump. That's 24,060 to 144,360 pesos per month, very wide range. And if you sum up, that's around ilan yan? Another 40%, right? Uh, 9 plus 2.9 is 11.9. 9 plus 27 point, yeah. So that's another around 40%. That's classified as the middle class. And according to PIDS, uh, our theme for PIDS, we want to grow that, no? From 40% and expand that. Of course, uh, you'd like to um, expand that by transitioning these low income into that category. And hopefully the poor transition to the low income. And maybe some of the middle class transition to the high income. But you know, let them help themselves. Maybe we don't need the government to help them, <laughs> right? You know, they will have their own initiative to do that. Uh, and um, if in doing so, in creating that wealth, hopefully it will be an engine for the entire economy as well uh, to, to also grow their incomes. So this is the picture we have of, of the entire country in terms of our size distribution of income. Now, 
how do we strategize towards that, no? Moving the, the poor to the low income, low income to the middle class. How do we do that? Well, one strategy is enterprise development along the value chain. And then we can say so many things, no? provide equipment, etc. Here is an innovative new approach. And it turns out when we scoured the literature, this has very seldom been applied. In fact, possibly the rapid growth project is the singular example so far for the Philippines. Uh, if, if we are mistaken, kindly correct us, no? But uh, that's what we've seen. Now, what are these matching grant schemes? They're one-off, non-reimbursable transfers to project beneficiaries based on a specific objective or a purpose. Let's say, okay, uh, we want to buy a roasting machine. It's a coffee cooperative. We need a big, modern, fancy roasting machine. Uh, we need 1 million pesos, for instance. However, instead of the, 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 the program supporting the entire 1 million, they might say, okay, you, you pay 50% and we'll come up with the 50%. Okay, that could be one possible. So it's the, the government or the, uh, the, the assistant, the enterprise developer, will match your one peso with one peso contribution. So you must contribute before as a condition for the, uh, the donor to contribute. Now, it may be linked with other financial services, especially facilitating the beneficiary to also secure a loan in order to provide for the contribution if, in, if they don't have cash. And often there are other conditionalities such as accessing business development services, such as simple business planning. You have to have a good business plan to justify that that coffee machine will really revolutionize your business. And how do you do that? Well, yeah. Uh, for those who are in management from MSU, you know the, 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 the routine. Well, it turns out that a lot of rural-based MSMEs uh, in the country, not just in Mindanao, lack the capacity to do what you management people have been doing. So what happens? Uh, we hire people like you, or what you will be, and support or the, build the capacity of these rural enterprises as part of this package deal. So this is not quite a subsidy for inputs or credit or provision of safety nets. The, okay, um, it's more like you have to put up with uh, especially 100% uh, subsidies, which tend not to demand counterpart from beneficiaries. So what, why, why this strategy? Why not just give them everything? Well, um, it seems to fill that niche uh, we have e economists have the fancy term of addressing market failures. Normally, we expect markets to work and deliver the resources efficiently, um, appropriate credit agreements, financing, and so on, uh, even the provi provision of consultancy services for technical assistance. But it turns out there's a lot of failures in the market and the need to be able to share risk. So asymmetric information, moral hazard, these constrain availability of financing for rural-based enterprises. Now, one powerful advantage of the counterpart demanded, so of course, that's a burden, right? Mabigat yan, hihingin mo yan from the uh, beneficiary cooperative or MSME. But it signals uh, that they're willing to put in their own resources. It signals that they're not just going to get the money, uh, get the equipment and leave it idle. They're going to work hard because they already put up 50% for it. And at the same time, uh, maybe putting up the entire 100% oh, kung ganun palang kagaling, why don't they just pay for the whole thing? Well, it's, it might be too risky. They might be willing to risk 500,000 pesos, but if the lumpy investment, the thing costs 1 million, they may not want to risk the entire 1 million. So the Remaining 50% charged to the, say, donor or Philippine government, they help share the risk. Because if the enterprise fails, the government doesn't demand the money back. So that's, that's the important part. No? Plus, the conditionalities of tying business development uh, will often uh, address information and technology constraints facing these enterprises. Now, of course, there are disadvantages. So, for instance, they might actually be willing to pay the whole 1 million. But they saw you, oh, you're, they're willing to pay 50%. So why don't, makalibrin tayong kalahate, no? We pretend that we're not willing to buy it by ourselves. We find this nice matching grant scheme, and then we write a proposal for it. 
So uh, are we just duplicating what they're already planning to do? What is the real additionality? So that's the, um, that's the uh, concern here. What's a possible uh, disadvantage also? Sustainability. Despite all of our best efforts, it might not be, it turns out to be a good business <coughs> proposition. They only went into it because it was a bad business decision, but because of your 50% counterpart, uh, they decided to take the risk. So there's also a question of being able to sustain it after <coughs> both parties invest in the venture. So there's a quite substantial uh, international literature, and I'm not going to go into this into detail. It's just that there is, uh, <laughs> as usual, researchers, <laughs> we, we say the evidence is mixed. There are some um, uh, aspects that seem to be advantageous with providing matching grant scheme versus other value chain development projects, but there are also some disadvantages as revealed in this literature. So for instance, it, uh, this more recent study, they reviewed 21 matching grant programs focused on agriculture. Um, the, the, the agriculture ones tend to be better, uh, perform better than those outside agriculture, and they identified a set of good practices that, if not properly implemented, turns out to be detrimental to the overall success of the project. What are those critical practices? Technical assistance in business planning, customized size, hindi yung one size fits all, lahat kayo 50 50. Imi yung iba siguro 40 70, depending on the capacity of the enterprise. And access to, uh, linkage to access to finance. So, yung ibang mga. Uh, to come up yung uh, MSMEs that have difficulty coming up with their counterpart, they're also linked to a bank that will allow them to borrow uh, to be able to provide that uh, financial assistance. So in the Philippines, we have encountered some examples where beneficiaries typically offer a counterpart, but when you check the details of the counterpart, they're not that strict. It may not actually meet the requirements or the de strict definition of a matching grant. So for instance, shared service facilities of DTI. This is very famous. That's also a project of DTI. And then they demand a counterpart, but when you check their counterpart, it's just a, basically a facility. And very often it's the LGU that uh, helps uh, partners with the MSME to provide the facility. There are other examples, PRDP, but often the equity contribution is still uh, often in the form of existing uh, assets or facilities or willing to put up the operating expenses. So if it's only the willingness to operate the machine after it's uh, given as a grant. That's not a real matching grant. A real matching grant is the machine itself, the, the MSME must put up some money, some uh, basically cash contribution towards it. And that precisely is the design of the rapid growth project. So the implementing agency is also DTI. Uh, it's supposed to run for six years and end next year, but I believe it will be extended. Uh, I mentioned the coverage already, and the value chains promoted here is coconut, cacao, coffee, and the set of processed fruit and nuts, for instance, dried mango, or uh, cashew, processed cashew. It's about uh, $94 million project cost, funded by the International Fund for Agricultural Development uh, as, a, as a loan with a small grant component, uh, contributions from the government of the Philippines and the LGUs, and here is Beneficiary farmers and MSMEs, instead of a token line, that's actually cold, hard cash coming from beneficiary farmers and MSMEs. Not the whole 4.94 million, but uh, a significant component of that. It's also envisioned that cooperating rural banks, land bank, development bank of the Philippines will also put up some contribution by participating here. Now, this is very busy, but essentially it, it tracks the, uh, this is the theory of change. It tracks the value chain development uh, type of project in those four value chains that I mentioned a while ago. Uh, so that uh, ultimately the goal is to uh, re reduce poverty incidence in target areas through, su through uh, um, sustained income increase among small farmers and unemployed rural workers. <laughs> Still read it. That's an achievement. Uh, and uh, rural uh, women and men across selected value chains. So here are the values project components. Uh, I won't explain in detail, but I think we can just focus on this part, the direct assistance to enterprises, which contains the matching grant and participatory implementation. 
let me also mention institutional strengthening uh, by uh, development of microenterprises and cooperatives or service hubs, etc. That's part of the business development. All right. So this is how it basically works. Uh, there should be a business plan within a detailed investment plan specific for that particular uh, cooperative or group of cooperatives in a uh, organized in a single venture. It covers business development and extension services and the equipment itself. So the, consul the, the, the consultancy or the technical assistance is folded into it. Um, normally, this service is provided by the private sector rather than the DTI itself. No? Or let's say uh, BA normally, but no, this is not the case here. The equity counterpart is in cash. Okay, For cooperatives, 40%. So if it's a machine, roasting machine, whatever it is, a, a warehouse, 60% will be picked by DTI under this project and 40% by the cooperative. And the recipient, DTI, and the financial service provider, if it's the one funding the counterpart, she'll sign a tripartite agreement. Another very important feature, because the counterpart is so high, the procurement manual allows for participatory implementation, meaning the... Uh, the enterprise itself, the MSA, is the one responsible for buying the equipment. This is a huge deal. I've seen so many value chain projects that the government does the procurement, and you know what happens with government procurement. No, I'm not saying it's corrupt, it's just very slow, or it comes up with the wrong stuff. No, it's, it's not quite appropriate to the needs. I've seen many examples of this to recount, no? But in this case, because the share is so high, that's how you convince the COA, uh, plus the, the fact that this is a foreign loan agreement, the COA was convinced, that, okay, yeah, let's relax uh, the, 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 the GPRA at that time, 9184 doesn't apply for this, okay? And then, so uh, once uh, there's a, a identified equipment for purchase and delivery, uh, given evidence of a purchase order, the, uh, and then the funds deposited in the land bank and proof that the funds were transferred, only then will the, um, will the, um, um, sorry, ano pala, hindi uh, 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 pala kaliwaan, isasabay, once they see the proof of the funds and the purchase order, then they're able to deposit the 60%, uh, if, if in case it's a 60%. Only then, when they see the evidence that there is exist a cash deposit in land bank, for instance, or in the FSP of a 40%, and that there is a purchase order from a legitimate supplier, then uh, only then. By the way, uh, the direct procurement also comes with assistance with the, um, from the DTI on how to do the specifications. It's part of the business planning, okay? And in doing, in, in providing that business planning for even the selection of the correct supplier and the correct equipment specification, there's also the verification of the supplier. So in that way, the DTI ascertains that the 40% will, the 40% plus 60% will go to a legit supplier for an actual piece of equipment or facility or case maybe, no? Or warehouse. Okay, now let's draw some insights from a baseline study. So I said, so that's a separate matching grant study. We focus on matching grants. Here is the actual baseline study covering all aspects, not just the matching grant, of the, uh, of the rapid growth project. So we have several authors uh, from PIDS there. And here are some of the uh, key findings. Uh, th th there's a lot of uh, other numbers here. I think the one slide with a bunch of numbers was enough. Let's just go straight to some of the findings. It did de uh, deliver business development services but there were some um, challenges and delays in strategic and detailed investment planning, uh, difficulty to find qualified consultants to give technical advice, subpar quality of some of the detailed investment plan submissions, so it had to go through several rounds of improvement. So um, larger cooperatives did co uh, there are varying levels of detail in commercial partnership agreements in the detailed investment plan. Some have very detailed, like this is the price, or if market conditions vary, the price varies within this range, etc. between the, say, cooperative and institutional buyers, say, Kenimer Foods. No? By the way, and Kenimer Foods is one of the, among others, no, uh, co um, participants in this project. 
Um, so larger cooperatives prefer to use their own cash, we found out. They seldom went into debt to be able to provide their counterparts because they're already large and they have their own cash. You know? uh, on the balance, it's not that big a deal for them to contribute the half million or one million. You know? um, we did flag some of the issues that we already uh, noted in the theoretical framework, right? Possible selection of enterprises already likely to succeed even without the grant. And actually, we uh, overestimated the willingness of MSMEs to incur debt. They prefer to pay cash. And because of this, so even the small enterprises, most of them were not willing either. And you know what happened? They just dropped out. So the, the smaller cooperatives, those with the less lower cash endowment, when they looked at the requirements, even though the business development services were being offered and all the technical assistance, and they said, uh, never mind. So they dropped out of the project. So there was a long list of potential cooperators in the regional strategic investment plan. When it came to the detailed investment plan, that list was considerably truncated. So that's what we observed. Okay, so I already mentioned that. So this is uh, what we observed from the some initial uh, implementation of the baseline. Uh, the matching grant does induce a strong participation of farmer organizations and their members. We uh, thereby avoid government procurement, and it has been complemented by intensive program of capacity development. And rather than go through the normal government agencies, there was a strong private participation, even in the business development sector. There was also some participation of SUCs. I don't know, maybe MSU might have been also one of the business providers for this, no? Um, some issues in implementation, no, no program, no large scale programs actually free of these. But now we go back to the questions I posed when I first introduced the idea of matching grant. Now, what are the real additionality and sustainability of this? Will they really be sustained? Will we still find them in operation five, uh, two, three, four, five years from now? Uh, we don't know yet because we just conducted a baseline study. We will find out when we conduct the end line study. Uh, that's supposed to be next year, but because of project extensions, precisely these delays, it might be uh, for, ne for uh, 2026. Okay, but this is just one salient observation. It seems that the neediest enterprises, so even just organizing as an enterprise, a lot of the poorest of the poor are unable to participate. But even if you are able to uh, uh, form a cooperative, imagine the poorest of the poor, you have a minimum 15 according to the CDA to form a cooperative. But then, will you be able to come up with the cash? Even providing the membership contribution is already a big deal for these poorest of the poor. So, uh, what this kind of program supports are those with already some capacity, both financial and technical, you know, to enter in these kind of modern business arrangements. And the question now is, if it bypasses the poorest of the poor in favor of the near poor and low income, is that necessarily a bad thing, right? So when we think of poorest of the poor, perhaps we should not be thinking of value chain development uh, or enterprise development because they are already targeted to entrepreneurs. We might want them, we might want to think of uh, programs like safety nets, conditional cash transfers, something that will bring them up to the level of the uh, low income right? Near poor and low income. Once they reach that level, only then will these types of interventions work. Meanwhile, these interventions might be a key to wealth creation and growing the middle class in the countryside. So isn't that what we are all after, the development 